Part 1. Fascisms and National Socialisms Chapter 1. The Background Origins The 19th century has seen the heyday of liberalism, the rise of parliamentary and democratic institutions, the affirmation of private enterprise, and individual liberty. The 20th century would be dominated by tendencies, collectivistic, authoritarian, anti-parliamentary, and anti-democratic, which stressed elitism against equality, activism and irrationalism against reason and contract, the organic community against the constitutional society. All these tendencies had their roots in the 19th century, and even earlier, in the organic nationalism of a Rousseau for whom the national body, made up of the dead, the living, and those as yet unborn, ideally obeyed a general will best defined as a special revelation, in the thought of Hegel for whom the divine purpose revealed itself progressively in the history of nations, and in the romantic affirmation of the primacy of subjective passions, of instincts and of will by which man was supposed to come nearest to nature, to reality, and to expressing his true self. Forgotten for a time, or, better still, adapted to the passion for science, positive knowledge, and rational activity which reigned over the century, especially over its second half. These concepts were revived in the 1890s and the early 1900s, when political and scientific disillusions swung the pendulum away from rationalism, away from the individualistic liberalism of the enfranchised, constitution-minded, free-trading middle classes. The prosperous, respectable, law-abiding bourgeoisie was decadent and corrupt, proclaimed Friedrich Nietzsche. Only dynamic men, ruthless in thought and action, could save the race. Instincts are stronger than reason and closer to reality, suggested Henri Bergson. The individual is a product of the clan, taught the sociologist Emile Durkheim. Collective consciousness has its own existence, prior to individual consciousness. And while these simplified ideas percolated from their books and lectures to a vaster public, new generations whom reigning rationalism bored stood by to welcome them. It was at this time that many of the ideas and institutions of the 19th century took a new shape, and sometimes a new direction, their function and meaning changing here and there to answer the needs of another age. Nationalism and socialism had both been born or weaned in the 19th century. They were to be reaffirmed in the 20th, but in forms less humanitarian and less liberal and for motives different from their original ones. Both nationalism and socialism had first appeared as liberating movements. In the shape they assumed during the 1900s, they would be less liberating than constricting, where once they had expressed the real needs and real resentments of men oppressed, exploited, and insecure, now they were tapped as myths, potentially powerful invocations addressed to tendencies and awarenesses that they themselves had been instrumental in creating over the past century. And, while we know that both nationalism and socialism were potent as separate, generally antagonistic creeds, both also contributed to those new phenomena peculiar to our age that we call fascism or national socialism. Neither fascism nor national socialism has been investigated thoroughly although both are highly characteristic of our time, a time in which theory and activism, pragmatic violence, and idealistic ruthlessness masquerading as positivism dominate or threaten all societies. The peculiar combination of nationalism and socialism seems to answer the needs of a great many states, even though this is not always explicitly acknowledged or self-conscious. The study of fascist and national socialist phenomena has suffered from several serious drawbacks. Both movements expressed themselves in actions and statements which repelled serious scholars as they repelled any humane person. Both movements were defeated in circumstances which make an unprejudiced approach difficult. And both movements, once defeated, were temporarily dismissed as having no further immediate significance, except of a purely historical order, and that could wait. Meanwhile, the fiery trail of fascism and Nazism, driving like destructive comets through Italian and German history, had drawn all eyes to these two countries, leaving little attention for similar phenomena elsewhere. Because neither fascism nor national socialism has been thoroughly analyzed, we lack sound definitions of either and frequently confuse the two. Only the ignorant still think that socialism and communism, much though they have in common, are one and the same thing. 
but even serious scholars are liable to refer to German fascism and to use fascism and national socialism interchangeably. True, the activity of German national socialists involved the violent methods which we associate with fascism, but violence is not the prerogative of either of these movements, and we shall see that there are fundamental differences between them which might help us to reach a new classification. Today, terms like Nazi or fascist, especially the latter, have become adjectives used in a sense that is only vaguely descriptive and generally pejorative. Their purpose is often to give a dog a bad name. Their use, seldom exact. Franco is a fascist. Baron was a fascist. Patin was a fascist. But Churchill, Eisenhower, and de Gaulle may be fascist too, in brackets, depending upon who is talking, end bracket. And so may Tito. Yet these phenomena, crucial to our time, are not only part of the history of the past, but of the present and the future as well. Fascism and National Socialism have to be analyzed and defined so as to establish in what they are alike and in what they differ, to discover what makes them start and what makes them tick, to understand to whom they appeal, why, and by what means. Theory and Practice There are two levels on which political ideas and political movements operate, theory and practice. Although we have been fascinated by fascist practice in Italy and Nazi practice under Hitler, we have paid relatively little attention to their theory and even less to evidence from other countries where similar movements and similar doctrines flourished. And yet the essence of certain doctrines is to be found in their expression when they have not yet, quote, arrived, end quote, in the period of formulation, controversy, soapbox oratory, and obscure pamphleteering in the discussions and exegesis of the movement's theorists, whose definitions and formulas may be removed from the brutal realities of the political struggle, but are accepted and honored in the breach, if not in the observance. The struggle to reach or to maintain power involves a political movement in hedging, compromise, backpedaling, and all the complications which follow when theory has to be connected with practice, when it has to be adapted to the concrete realities of traditional politics and political maneuver. It is the theories, the doctrines, the ideologies of fascism and national socialism, and the attempts to carry these into practice, that will be considered in the following pages. It has been held that national socialist doctrine is of no importance, because Hitler came to power in spite of it, and, once in power, did not apply it. At least, not the socialist part. This kind of argument does not prevent us from studying Marxist or Leninist doctrine, even though the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 went counter to then-existing theories, and though Bolshevik practice since that time has only partially conformed to it. The aspect of communism changes according to whether it is practiced by Russians, Serbo-Croats, or Chinese, but we can study the theory of communism and learn a good deal from it. In the United States, too, Republicans and Democrats are elected to office having expressed a variety of ideas and made a variety of promises, although everyone accepts as a fact of life that platforms are made to run on, not to stand on. Nevertheless, political scientists know very well that platforms and ideologies are significant, partly because they do tell us something about what the candidate and his party think, in brackets, or would like to think, or would like the public to think they think, end bracket, and partly because they reflect a public, the issues this public is likely to be affected by, to vote for, or in some way, to support. The argument is current that fascist manifestos, or the program of the National Socialist German Workers' Party, are meaningless because they were never really carried out. In fact, such statements were acted upon to quite a surprising extent. Even if they had not been, we should still learn a good deal by examining them, especially if we compare them to similar programs or doctrines evolved by movements in other countries and, perhaps, in other circumstances. Earlier Movements Movements of a National Socialist Nature are not peculiar to the 20th century. F. L. Schumann, in his book The Nazi Dictatorship, New York, 1935, suggests that the idea, if not the name, can be traced back to the German Romantics, to the autarkic economist Friedrich List, and also to Ferdinand Lassalle, the German-Jewish socialist leader who was a contemporary of Bismarck. Fifteen years before Schumann's study, in a book published just after the First World War, Prussianism and Socialism, Oswald Spengler had argued that the prototype of the modern socialist state is to be found in the ideas of Frederick the Great, founder of the perfected Prussian bureaucracy. 
It is equally possible to trace the pattern of the planned totalitarian society back to Plato's Republic and the fascist mentality to the turbulent, unscrupulous Callicles, who appears in another Platonic dialogue, Gorgias. Even if we try to narrow things down, we shall find self-asserted national socialists rampant as far back as 70 years ago. In 1896, Friedrich Naumann, the great economist of the Wilhelmian era, tried to organize what he called a national social party, something like it already existed in Austria, where it was called the German Workers' Party, and where, in 1896, its leader, Karl Luger, became mayor of Vienna, a position he retained until 1910. During this time, he carried out what by all accounts was a most thorough and efficient program of municipal socialism, and also provided the basic inspiration of a young drifter called Adolf Hitler, who sometimes sold the party paper in the streets. In 1918, Luger's movement would change its name to the German National Socialist Party. In France, meanwhile, in the same year that Luger became mayor of Vienna, a typical nationalist buccaneer was being given a lavish funeral in the Cathedral of Notre Dame. With the Archbishop of Paris officiating and Maurice Barret, in his funeral oration, asserting that the Marquis de Moray, whose memory they had gathered to honor, had been both nationalist and socialist. As for himself, said Barret, he also liked to insist on the intimate union of nationalist and socialist ideas. Barret had already expressed this view in a periodical, La Cocarde, where extreme nationalists collaborated with extreme syndicalists. The review only lasted from 1894 to 1895, but while it lasted, it preached the gospel of social revolution, in quotations, whose accomplishment no power can henceforth prevent, end quotation. It lambasted the established order, and it attacked with particular vigor the capitalist system that throve upon it. One of Barre's admirers considered that the review, in quotation, was exactly socialist in that it led a relentless struggle against economic liberalism and called for the organization of labor and the suppression of the proletariat, that is to say, its integration in society, end quotation. This is not what most socialists would recognize as socialism, but there are a great many variants of socialism, and we shall see that this is the one which fascists and national socialists favor. It was this that Barre himself had in mind, and when in 1898 he stood for election in Nancy, capital of his native Lorraine, his program was headed Nationalism, Protectionalism, and Socialism, and his supporters gathered in the Republican Socialist Nationalist Committee. They did not get very far, but the label was attractive. It was revived a few years later by Pierre Petri, a dissident trade union leader who tried to gather in a socialist national party the working-class opposition to the doctrinaire policies of the French Confederation of Labor, the CGT. Meanwhile, the idea itself was bringing young intellectuals together in a number of groups and reviews in which the nationalist disciples of Charles Maras worked together with the revolutionary syndicalist disciples of Georges Sorel. Maras, a convinced royalist, had built up a movement, the Action Française, whose purpose was to restore the monarchy, a sense of order, hierarchy, and discipline in French political and intellectual life. Sorel, on the other hand, who came from the Republican left, was seeking to renovate current social revolutionary ideas and adapt them to the conditions of the 20th century. At first sight, no more different points of view could be conceived. Both men, however, agreed in their criticism of the existing political, economic, and social order of parliaments, democracy, liberalism, and capitalism and both despise the existing parties of the right and left and their leadership for their conservative, stick-in-the-mud policies. The brief flirtation did not go far, and its inspiration finally foundered in the Great War, in which most of the young enthusiasts lost their lives. But it represented a tendency, perhaps a need, which has persisted until our own day. In the next 30 years, more than a score of groups and movements appeared in France alone, bearing titles like National Syndicalists, Monarchist Socialists, National Proletarians, Revolutionary Patriots, or simply National Socialists. Even if we consider that the combination of these supposedly antagonistic ideologies amounted to little, in movements that were often insignificant and generally short-lived, the question remains why people should be so interested in the conjunction of nationalism and socialism as to go on suggesting it, 
and what it was that made this conjunction seem relevant to so many about this time. The hint of an answer may be found in Cluard's words about the Cocard's, quote, relentless struggle against economic liberalism, end quote. Anti-liberalism. All opposition movements of the 20th century seem to have in common this opposition to a liberalism defined on the economic plane as the application of competitive laissez-faire and on the political plane as the individualistic counterpart of laissez-faire, which allows particular interests to assert themselves at the expense of the social whole. In opposing individualism and the apparently chaotic conclusions of private enterprise, their critics rediscover collectivism. On such grounds, they find that they have more in common with socialists, in brackets, though not with social democrats, end bracket, than with more conservative groups, and that it might be convenient to adopt some of their ideas or even to enter into an alliance with them. This approach was the basis of German national communism, whose possibilities impressed quite a number of people in the Weimar Republic of 1919 and the early 1920s. While the communist Karl Radek was interned in the Berlin prison of Moabit, he was visited, among others, by Baron Jugend von Reibnitz, a colleague of Marshal Ludendorff in the Cadet Corps, and, quote, the champion in officer circles, not only of alliance with Soviet Russia, but of the so-called peaceful revolution. Reibnitz was of the opinion that the central task of restoring the productive forces of Germany was insoluble without the nationalization of industry and without factory committees, end quotation. The great Walter Rathenau, himself a representative of vast industrial interests, and another visitor in what Professor E. H. Carr has called, quote, Radek's political salon, end quote, admitted that there could be no return to the old capitalist order. A new society in which capitalism, the right of inheritance, the old social categories would disappear, in which the most intelligent and the strongest would be the leaders, and it should be created by the working class under the leadership of an aristocracy of intellect which would closely resemble Dr. Rathenau himself. In another vein, 15 years later, one of France's most influential economic journalists argued that socialist opposition to liberal individualism attempts to provide the kind of collective awareness which liberal capitalism lacks, and that the only hope of neutralizing the socialist appeal lay in the production of a collective and unifying ideology that could match it. A good statement of this point of view may be found in a book published in Paris in 1943 during the German occupation, entitled Theses for the National Revolution. In quotations, The capitalist system, it declares, is dominated by private profit. The capitalist age is characterized by selfishness. In its present form, capitalism is condemned to disappear, because it has not associated the majority of producers to the distributive process. End quotation. This kind of awareness, this kind of scruple, had not played a very significant role in the 19th century middle-class thought, especially not after 1848. The first to discover the drawbacks of liberalism had been those well-intentioned members of the middle and upper classes whose reason, conscience, or sensibilities had been shocked by the sufferings of the urban poor. Their yearnings for a better organized society would survive as one of the strands of our story. More concrete political action could be expected from those who first felt the ill effects of liberal free enterprise, that is, the propertyless workers. Particularly, in the great and growing cities of Western Europe, industrialization created a class of permanent wage earners, devoid of property and therefore not committed to individualistic principles. Such people were amenable to collectivistic arguments first of a nationalistic, then of a socialistic sort. Adam Smith had argued that men further the common interest when they pursue their own interests with enlightened selfishness. This argument, however, was not convincing to propertyless wage earners whom the system exploited without satisfying. They were not persuaded that what is good for General Motors is good for the nation, or perhaps they felt that they were not really full members of this kind of nation. Tariffs, commercial competition, threats of war on the one hand, the growing effectiveness of syndicalist organization and its more active participation in national and international politics, on the other, all emphasize the superior effectiveness of groups over unorganized individuals. Meanwhile, the middle class were facing problems of their own. Where earlier, opportunities had not been lacking for the small entrepreneur to set up in business, make money, and rise in the social scale, now big business, big capital, growing labor, taxing and interfering states 
were all squeezing him out of business. And so, beginning in the late 19th century, certain sections of the middle classes, threatened especially by the encroachments of the competition of great capitalist enterprises, began to consider their danger and to welcome, or at least, to heed collectivistic doctrines which stressed the need to regulate the workings of capital in order to protect the people, in brackets, in this occurrence themselves, end bracket, from private exploitation. First, they resented the kind of unregulated speculation that made unwitting investors lose their savings in spectacular crashes. Then they came to fear the competition of large department stores, chain stores, and trusts, in brackets, those hegis monstrous that Mr. Dooley talked about, end bracket. It was no longer enough for a man to work hard, save, and thrive. A big combine could put him out of business. His savings might disappear overnight because of obscure machinations he ignored. His farm might become useless because people halfway across the world could produce more wheat and fatter sheep and ship them to his country and still undersell him. This seemed sheer chaos to the little man, and it was easy to persuade him that the economic developments which were endangering and eliminating small and medium enterprises, and which affected farmers as well, were typical of a system that was intrinsically anarchic. In a sense, that was true. But economic anarchy had gone unnoticed as long as its possibilities had helped rather than hindered the making of money. Now, liberal economics started to look threatening to a number of people who had in the past benefited from it, and, by a natural equation, it became connected in many minds with liberal politics, similarly competitive and similarly anarchic, which had better be replaced. In brackets, the argument began to be heard, end bracket by a more reliable order, restrictive, protective, controlling private enterprise in order to protect it, not to destroy it. Naturally, most of these people did not know how to formulate their resentments and their claims, and their plight did not attract much attention from the theorists until the 20s and the 30s when it became really widespread and manifest. But this seems to be the basis of the right-wing spectrum noticeable during the last half century, and also the basis of differences of orientation to be found within the so-called right, the difference between conservative and radical tendencies. Those who benefited from the established order were firmly conservative, and so were some of the small, threatened property owners. But the mass of the latter, together with those whom the system stripped of the security and the income with which they once enjoyed, would oscillate between variants of radicalism, all of which repudiated liberalism and capitalism, some envisaging a return to a sort of Jeffersonian golden age, while others wanted to forge ahead, through revolution, to a new collectivistic social order. Insofar as they all suspected or feared the class covetousness of socialist claims and ignored the class character of their own resentments, these people were united in opposition to conventional socialism and communism. They were united, too, by a common belief in the national entity, and in the value of national definition, a belief which the Marxists traditionally denied, or, at least, played down. Nationalism was going to furnish the ideological basis on which otherwise divergent sections of the right would join in temporary alliances, and also the inspiration for doctrines of reform which the less conservative sections could accept, adopt, and follow.